very firm motions like this. None of them are like, try reading. Try reading aloud at 12.5. So we're just going to make it as far as we make it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. 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 Um, hello, if we haven't met already, I'm Dessa. Thanks for coming to like a new poetry reading, and thank you so many of you. You had a nice word about the show yesterday for me and Joshua and Viva. <laughs> Okay, um, um, I figure I would start with some haikus, just to kind of, you know, shake it out. Warm up. Without me, how would my headache get around? <laughs> and this is a family friendly cruise. Olives on fingers, Sprite surgeon stemware, new shoes, the kids' table rules. <laughs> Please don't finger count. It debases us all. Trust, I am hyper. <laughs> okay, um, this could, I, I, should, I should also just say, like, for a new poetry reading, there are, um, like, this isn't like a crazy erotica thing, but there are some bad words in here with the littles. I'll give you maybe a bit of earmuffs time, but this would be an earmuffs poem. <laughs> this goes out to all my fellow contact wearers. Soft contacts are like helper jellyfish. Each one comes in a tiny plastic dish sealed with foil and floating in a private pool of sterile tears. They last two weeks and you are not supposed to sleep with them. The wetness of the saline and the wetness of my eye suck the contacts into fit and pull focus on the world. Objects that have melted into one another overnight separate like dancers parted by the gym lights. The hex tiles of the bathroom floor snap crisp. My reflected face, tired, reports the freckle senses. My interior, even, is corrected. The capillaries, distinct now from red round organ meat, bones cratered by tiny pores, and each tumbling blood cell neatly dimpled. Outside my apartment, the leaves on every tree secede from the collective green to stand alone with one vote only. Distant street signs crystallize to tell me where I am and what I may not do. Two weeks spent by in 2020 and we are at my favorite part. On the evening of the final day, I like to whisk one lens out and fling it, sometimes while I'm walking, sometimes while talking on the phone, and I'll just drop it. Let the lines relax around you. Let the convex wonder flutter, still soft and warm like robot flesh. Then I'll do the other. And in the morning, the fresh scent is so smooth that I blink and blink for pleasure. My right eye gets it first. I stage the small thing on my fingertip, like the petal of a flower that was not approved for manufacture, made of the gel in which the universe was prototyped before it was infused with substance and with color, before there was enough to see, to make seeing worth the trouble. And I lean in and absorb it like cocaine off a key, and I stand there half-corrected, one eye in each world. And now it's time to load the left. Amniotic, barely blue, a thin shade of slip of sky, and it clings, then settles into place between the iris and the lid, between myself and me. We're just gonna do some. Pro oh my God! We're just gonna do some prose and some poetry. This one's called Bot. It's always as I'm finishing the last assignment of the day, everything loaded and ready to go, that I hit one of those captcha screens, the little wavy letters you're supposed to rekey to prove you're not a bot. And no matter how I squint, I've never been able to decipher those things which makes me want to zoom in and saute my computer. I can do math in my head. I can multitask. I don't take breaks. I'm laser focused and fast as fuck. The one goddamn thing that I cannot do is capture. Because only humans can do those. I allow myself 20 seconds of total rage. I X out of the window I've been working in and start again from the beginning. I've got 40,000 email addresses to hit tonight, twice as many in the morning. The cursor flashes like a two-chambered heart, and I settled in for another lousy decade of all-nighters. 
This one, um, if I told you, yeah, I think I'm going to leave the light if I sit. But it doesn't really matter because you can see it. Um, this one was written as I was struggling to forgive someone who I really, really wanted to forgive. I couldn't like figure out the mechanics of it. <clears throat> to forgive is to summon your character, red-eyed and sober, and to command it to behave against the current, <clears throat> the current of your instinct. To reach up and take down your own flag. To forgive is to break the wishbone of a living bird who consents to the procedure and volunteers to stay awake to save on anesthesia. It is to make a snow angel in the sawdust beneath the workbench where they are shaving down your pride. To arrive at mercy, you pass through a tiny little door whose polished knob is the head of a brass pin. You do not enter more. You undo yourself, pass yourself in pieces to be reassembled on the other side. Your vertebrae go singly to be refretted on the wire of your spine. The larger bones are first reduced by fire. It happens in the early morning hours, often in a sudden soft collapse. It happens when your lungs are empty and your heart is still between contractions and you will feel a cracking like a breaking paper nail some pain, then swift release, and there you'll have it. Every grievance unspooling at your feet and shining like cassette. I don't know how many have done it and survived. They don't come back to say But I have seen them through the keyhole, swaying, mute, serene, like rag dolls assembled by the blind. It's less bony here, so I'm just going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, uh, so I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yeah, like an over, there's, a, there's a heavy contingency. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be a writer when I was, from, from when I was a babe, a medium-sized babe. And it's just a hell of a market, at least for me, to break into. And I started doing slam poetry in an effort, yeah, in an effort to like get into anything literary, you know? And it was there that I met a bunch of rappers who were like, hey, you should try doing some of that over music. So for me, it was kind of a circuitous rap, you know? It's a, to music for me, it was very much like language driven. And um, really indie was at least for me. You know, it was just like a bunch of dudes essentially that I knew would like skateboard together after school um, were rapping. I thought they were really, really good. I thought they were super talented and angry, but in a constructive way, and all the same things that I was mad about. But it was kind of a hard sled. And so I worked for many years as a like a waitress and a, uh, a medical technical writer, like writing the manuals essentially that a uh, salesperson might talk to a physician about, like um, pacemakers and defibrillators. And for 10 years, I worked as a face painter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We respect face painters. <laughs> Feel that. Um, so I wanted to read a little bit of prose that was written about like trying to figure out how to do the art thing, but first here's a quick glossary of terms that might be helpful. Dessa, American recording artist, type A personality, type O blood door, type 60 words a minute. <laughs> Doomtree, a hip hop collective based in Minneapolis, founded in 2001, maybe, who didn't keep great friends. Known for genre bending releases that blend punk, rap, pop, rock, and classical sounds in an impassioned physical live show that's part tent revival, part intramural hockey game. <laughs> Day sheet. A detailed schedule of the day's events on tour, including drive time, phoners, time zone changes, opening and acts, Wi-Fi passwords, catering information, and set times. For example, what time do we hit tonight? 
Check your own day sheet, my guy. Femc slash feminine. You do not need these terms. <laughs> or anything. anything. Hype, as, in, as a verb, is to back up another rapper's vocals. It usually is delivered in unison with that line. It's usually a line delivered in unison with the lead vocalist to allow her or him time to breathe, to inhale, to deliver the next line. Spit a pillow. To perform a rap verse, a cappella, the rest of Doomtree argues that I invented this term out of whole cloth. I did not. <laughs> but I will concede that it sounds dated and like it's trying much too hard, a description that sometimes fits me too. Rat King. A tetherball sized knot of microphone cords that forms in the center of the stage as five rappers run around each other all night. <laughs> Spitter, a technical rapper capable of delivering complex patterns with speed. In Doomtree, Mike and Sims are arguably the spitters. Tour blues, spells of sadness that hit either midway through the routing when you sulk against the window with your headphones on for seven hours a day, when they hit after your home, when you have to do laundry at regular intervals, and maintain human relationships, and everyone confuses your job with a vacation, which is insulting, and you are exhausted, you have what might be bronchitis, and you've lost a lot of muscle mass sitting in the car all day, you've blown out your knees by jumping on them, and as soon as you're out of the car, and now that there's actually some downtime, you're not sure how to function without the adrenaline baseline of living in a motor vehicle with the other laws flows. Ex, my ex-boyfriend. Depending on how you count, we dated on and off for 32 months or 14 years. We've been in the same rap crew for most of our adult lives. We've been trying to fall out of love and stay out for a very long time. I present to my book my side of the story. He was nice enough to green light the tongue of it. Okay, so the face painting thing. Started when I was like 14, and I dug it. Like it's not air quotes cool, but it was very artistic. Like there was a lot of like actual visual artists who were hired by this agency, and so that shit was like legitimately awesome. You know, like take pictures just to have awesome, really cool stuff. And um, they sometimes would work at like events where you had to be juried in. You know, so you have to essentially like audition for these gigs, and um, the paint had real crushed gold in it. And the, um, the glitter we used was like holographic and sanded on all the sides, so just in case it wound up in a kid's cornea, it was safe. But the shit was just incredible in some way. Really breathtaking. And uh, I worked usually in a costume that entailed like a spray painted shiny set of red boots, big tails adorned with holographic ribbons, and then a huge, very pretty set of. Uh, Butterfly wings are made to look like monarchs, but they were the kind that are mounted on a frame, attached to straps, and they were made with real hand-cut feathers. So they're, you know, kids fun to shit. Yeah, it's very small. Okay, so this is a little bit about face painting. Also trying to be a professional rapper. I don't buy into the hype about children is untrammeled innocence. I think they're seated with all the human traits. Sometimes they share even when they have less than they need. Sometimes they hoard even when they have more than they want. They just don't have the resources for big projects, and they get tired early. But I do believe that kids warrant special consideration. They have big heads that goof up their center of gravity. They don't have properly formed kneecaps until they're like three. They haven't been in the rock tumbler long enough to have their curiosity and affection polished down. They'd ask me to marry their dads just so that I could come and live with them. Aww. They'd rub my leg while I was painting just to rub my leg. They'd fall asleep with their faces in my hands, and I'd have to wake them up, reintroduce myself, and remind them where they were, Aww. and then slowly turn a mirror to reveal the butterfly mask I painted while they were unconscious. For someone who is not particularly romantic about kids, I think I take them more seriously than most people that I know. And sometimes, while I was working on one, another would sneak behind me to reach out and very lightly touch one of my wings. I'd shiver and I'd yelp 
And she'd return to the line freaked out and excited, hissing to her friends, I told you they were real. <laughs> and most days I fielded the same set of questions. Can I get two? Unlikely. This line is very long. But if there are no blank faces, come back and I'll do you another side. Are you a kid or an adult? The costume made it tough to tell if I was a giant child or just a parent in disguise. My answer then was usually, I'm an in-between. If your wings are real, then can you fly? Kid, nobody can fly while painting. <laughs> Is this like what you do? Is this like your job? <laughs> Well, honey, that one is complicated. Some days I paint faces, yes, for money. And sometimes I write instructional manuals as an independent contractor. And sometimes I wait tables at a sports bar downtown. And sometimes I work for a temp for an agency like Dolphin Staffing, which is not nearly as magical as it sounds. But at night, I am a rapper at a precarious point in the night. I said, is this like your job? <laughs> well, I'm face painting and you're waiting to get face painted. So is that your job, being second in line to get face painted? Are you a professional painting? <laughs> do you have a boyfriend? I do, but only for a little while longer. He's becoming a famous person, I think. And there is no competing for first place in his heart because that position was already occupied by music making when I met him. And maybe the best spot in my heart is reserved for the same thing. But all sorts of people want a piece of him now, including beautiful women that I don't think he has the self-discipline to turn away. And I am a sizzling mess, angry and jealous and vengeful and sad. When we're on tour, I smile on stage and cry backstage, hiding in the women's room of a club somewhere in America with my feet pulled up on the toilet seat. You can cry undiscovered for a very long time. There is rarely another woman in the bed until just before yours. On the road, in the tour van, a phrase like, I just need some space, means moving to the back bench seat. It hurts to be near him, but leaving Doomtree feels unthinkable. The wider rap scene looks neither attractive nor hospitable, and the prospect of joining another crew, at that point it felt downright outlandish. It would be like losing your kid at the food court and being handed a different toddler by a mall cop. They're not interchangeable, man. That's the truth, kid. I can't share it with you because you're too young and this is supposed to be a party and I am being paid by the hour. One day, possibly jacked up on Orange Crush and Sheet Cake, an impatient kid asked, well, can you fly when you're done painting? I can't just fly from sitting still. I need a running start, I said. <laughs> but you flew here. I did. That was a mistake, I thought. Lying to children gets convoluted very quickly. <laughs> and now at the end of the night, they'd all be expecting me to fly home. Just as I feared, there was a gang of girls hovering around as I packed up, all waiting to see how I flew. When I turned to go, they followed, absolutely as far as they were allowed, watching. <laughs> they all wanted to know if I'd fly home, if I was a real thing. Or if I get into some beat up sedan and let them down like everybody else. Damn it, I thought. Damn it, damn it, damn it. I told them I needed a running start, so I ran. I didn't know how long I'd have to go. I passed my car, figured I would double back later. I was breathing hard. I was panting like an animal. My pains were banging around in my caboodle. My wings were bouncing on the elastic straps that held them to my back. I figured I'd run until they got tired of waiting to see if I ever made it off the ground, or I'd run until I was too small to see a bucket. Maybe I'd just run until they were all grown ups with their own day jobs, dreams, and disappointments. <laughs> I know that there's like a, like a culture of, um, of capture here on the cruise, which I think is awesome. Um, I'm just going to ask that for like the stuff I'm reading now, to maybe not put it up in a place that can be shared just because I haven't published it yet.
Um, pretty soon, I'm going to do some questions. So if, if people have anything, if there are any questions to be had, I will pay them. So I think Thomas is going to set up a microphone um, on one of the center aisles. If you've got questions, feel free to queue up. Uh, this one is called Socket. And I guess like staying in rooms with which, with which we are unfamiliar, I think this experience might be familiar. Socket. I check again with my fingers, feeling for the holes where the lightning is dispensed. I know both shapes, but they just won't align. One prong is always wrong ways, nosing into the wall again like a tiny mad cow. The task is difficult in darkness, but darkness is the occasion for the task. I try to guide the little metal antlers home, but they refuse to dock. The wall self-seals against me, personally. The outlet is a skull with just one eye, and this flagrant disregard of facts and physics collapses all my frustrations into this one refusal, this concentration of insult, but then the times sink in. I lock the circuit closed, and the light slams up, and I can see her, reflected in the full length, kneeling and surprised to be discovered. The real me, who did not know that I was coming. Okay, if there are no questions, I am barreling through. Um, again, it's like not until you kick it with a bunch of former strangers, new friends on a ship, that you realize just how much of your work is about disaster. <laughs> and see, this poem is called Alice Drowning. At first, they thought she was pregnant. Then somebody spent an afternoon, afternoon online and decided the problem was probably in her inner ears, in those little semicircular canals that house the human sense of balance. Or perhaps it was playing vertigo or chronic nausea. Is that a thing, chronic nausea? The neighbors called with a dozen suggested remedies, but nothing helped or hurt her. She stumbled through her daily chores for years, catching herself on countertops and chair backs before receiving a proper diagnosis. It turned out that Alice, who had never left Nebraska, was terminally seasick. Irrespective of her circumstances, Alice was destined to drown at sea. And whether her end roared up from platinum waves with a trident in his fist, or simply held her round, white cheek to the linoleum, that was her fated end. And for her part, Alice had known it from the start. If her careworn mother had thought to review the crayon drawings of 20 years before, she had found a girl, indicated with yellow spiral curls. At home with giant fish, drawn with one continuous line, like a figure eight with one blunted edge. She suffered nightmares with no pictures, just the sound of her heart beating hard and fast, then hard and very slow. She had a desperate compulsion to stargaze, an unromantic, obsessive impulse to memorize the constellations as I swept across the black expanse of prairie sky. And in high school, Easily the hardest years, she salted her baths. But by her early 20s, she was nearly oblivious to the constant motion. She rebounded from dinner table to dishwasher, accustomed to the world and tilt. She rode hinges in a world of steady cornfields. Protracted melancholy is a hazard at sea, and self-pity is unbecoming conduct of a sailor. When they found her calm and blue, her lungs were full of brine. Like, um, even now, when we don't have any 
you know, satellite access. Like I'm still texting myself, knowing that I'll see it as a sent text, like little phrases or words, or if there's an image, you know, that seems like promising later. I think I do a lot of like capture of raw material, even if I'm not developing an idea. I do try to capture it. So I think in the past, before like iPhones, that was like Walgreens receipts and parking tickets, you know, and some. But I think the the song "Call Off Your Ghost" was on the back of a parking ticket in a car um, to try to capture them before they evaporate. So on your uh, phone, do you use a notes or Evernote or something? I do. I use the notes function because I like the fact when I can because I like the fact that it will then you know sync up with my laptop. But to do myself a little service later, I try to just generally class the idea. So I have like four main documents. I have like a poetry RM, poetry rough material, lyrics rough material, screenplay rough material, and prose rough material. Just so that later when I'm working, it's almost just like dumping the entire bag upside down, you know, like jigsaw puzzle style. And maybe I'm working on a song about, you know, whatever, a hurricane. And I go through and I say, oh, I have you know three or four like pebbles that might or bone fragments essentially that might then later be arranged into the skeleton of this song. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Totally, because that's like a stay up at night angry at yourself moment. Yeah. You know, if you had a good thought at dinner and you were too polite to take a second to write it down, and yeah. you can't remember it anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, new man, my name is Tommy. First time cruiser, first time on the Joko, first time on the Joko, we already got so many in common. But I thought I was awesome, just a quick comment. Love Fire Mill, awesome film. Which brings me to my question. Oh, where did you draw the lyrical inspiration from, just generally speaking, on songs like that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, having been most interested in creative nonfiction first. So like, you know, songwriting was a, uh, I arrived through, as I mentioned, like through prose. I think that most of our like um, universal feelings are actually most effectively communicated through metaphor because we've all felt like the sentence I'm heartbroken doesn't do quite as much work. Is either a great metaphor or is providing some detail of that lived experience. You know, whether it's like I can taste my own mascara or a tan line where a wedding a wedding ring used to be. You know, something that's like in your body, in your vision. Um, so I think for writing a song like Fire Drills, um, I guess I I hoped to sort of adhere to that like show don't tell. You know, I don't use the word like intersectional feminism um, in that song. I think for me, I am at least more moved when hearing about people's lived experiences. And then we can move to what that means in a scholastic, academic, and, and philosophical way. But that, the, that role, I think, has to do more with knowing. And the lived experience world has to do more with feeling. So looking for the moments and experiences that can serve as first-person evidence for how we move through the world, that kind of stuff, I think, communicates more directly to the, to the heart schools. Thanks. Uh, in keeping with the inspiration of that team, uh, how was Kai Riso and what was writing Don't Yell in that way? I think Kai Riso has one of the coolest voices in radio. I just think it's very cool. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I like listening to him, even though I'm not like a fintech person. Um, I like the way he explains things in a I don't know, just like plain spoken kind of way, which isn't usually like how finance and science usually work. You know, they're kind of a player's game, riddled with jargon and stuff. So I've been a long time listener to Kyra Doll, and I've been on his show like once or twice before. I just like, what are the financial realities of, um, of being, I'm going to sit down again, um, what are the financial realities of being a musician? And so when President Biden nominated Janet Yellen to be the Secretary of the Treasury, um, he had, like, just off the cuff remarked, like, Wouldn't it, we should get a little Miranda to do, a, like, a Hamilton-style send-up. And, you know, that guy is an looking for work, obviously. He's <laughs> got a full dance card. Um, and so one of the producers on Kai's team was like, hey, just as a total spoof, do you think that it'd be, that you'd be game to write something out, you know? 
And yeah, then I started watching like a bunch of Khan Academy, you know, <laughs> like crash course in monetary and fiscal policy to like see if there was any cool slang there. And there's tons. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. A lot of lot of like bird stuff, you know, hawks and hawkish and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I said, yeah, I'd love to. And then um, I called up my two collaborators, Laserbeak and Andy Thompson, with whom I work really regularly. Yeah, and yeah, and there was just like, could we do a musical style setup of the new nominee for the you know Department of Treasury? And they're like, yeah. Sure, what does that do? And it's always like, you know, Tuesday at nine. And so we just really quickly wrote some out. We never mastered it. I think the version that they play on the radio, the right channel, still doesn't work. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do it. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, so I think the first thing that comes to sometimes for words by setting them to music. And it comes in two kind of categories, three categories. One is length, that if you have something to say that requires 11,000 words, it's gonna be a long song. <laughs> um, the other is like, if you really do have something that requires like a, a particular set of words, and you're not gonna go totally avant-garde and not worry about like rhyming and scansion and meter and stuff, like um, intersectional feminism, it, Sometimes I prefer to address complicated concepts in an essay where I don't have to worry about serving more than one master, where I don't have to worry about how this fit in with the previous line. And then the biggest thing for me is timing, to quantize. Like if particularly in comedy or if you've got something funny or something deep, you know, if you're performing to a little bitty room or to a really big full room, the amount of time that you let go after you've close the deal, whether that's a punchline or the final line of a poem or whatever, or a mid-line mid break, like being able to make that call and just let a pause develop on its own until you've fully harvested whatever there is to harvest, whether that's laughs or like ooh or whatever, and then begin again. Like that's not a luxury that you have in music to do all the time. You know, you can slow down the tempo of the song, you can make some changes, you know, with great players about, um, about adding breaks and stuff, but you're free of the grid in poetry and prose and a lot of performance. And that's huge. I think also, like, you know, there are some art forms where the temporal dial is in control of the audience. So, for example, if you go to look at a painting, you get to choose how long you look at the painting. If you go to look at a sculpture, you get to choose. If you go to watch a movie, well, then the director got to choose how long the movie was. The temporal dial is in the creator and not the observers, right? So music, obviously, is one where the creator has temporal control and prose on a page, the audience has temporal control. And I think that makes a huge distinguishing, it's a huge factor that distinguishes those. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, Dessa. I love your work. Your metaphors are incredible. Um, I have a very unoriginal question, but um, do you have any favorite pieces of writing advice that you have given slash received? Oh, any favorite pieces of writing that I've like that I've read as a reader? Writing advice specifically. Oh, writing Anything advice. Particularly helpful that you've received or shared. I'd love to hear. Oh, sure. And sorry, prose or poetry or both? Um, both. Um, maybe. I was thinking maybe leaning more pros, but any. Really. Okay, yeah, I would say, I don't know if this was like an actionable, you know, like there's some really hot takes that you hear that you're like, ooh, that's true, but it might not feel actual, like I know exactly how to go do that and implement that kind of work. But I remember listening to, when I was starting in poetry, somebody said, you know, prose is an additive process. You start with a blank page, you know, and you're writing stuff, you're writing stuff, you're writing stuff, then you're editing, but it's your adding shit. Whereas poetry is more like sculpture. You start with a block of marble and you take things away until it's art. You know, so it's a reductive process of that capacity. I would say though that for prose, I think some of the advice that at least is most like um, 
resonant with me now is I think I used to I used to fall in love with with phrases, and that's still like where my big love. It isn't paragraphs and it isn't story arcs. I love sentences. That's what I'm into. I'm sentences. And I used to love writing them so much that sometimes I found that I would describe the same thing three or four times in a row because all the sentences had merit and felt nice. Being comfortable enough to throw away good work because you trust your brain to have more good work in it. I think initially when we begin, a lot of us are in kind of scarcity mode. I've had 11 good ideas. I can't afford to sacrifice two, <laughs> you know? That's more than 10%. Um, whereas, it, when we become more comfortable like editing, we know that, um, that good prose is not finite. We don't have to hoard it. There will be more tomorrow. So becoming more a comfortable editor. And then also, probably stuff you've heard already, but like the first thing you write down, rarely, but really rarely, is the first thing that will appear in the finished copy. So feeling comfortable after you're done to say, ah, I was just getting rolling with those first three paragraphs. What if I just chuck those into the ocean? start mid-scene? Or what if I move my last sentence first? You know, so being comfortable when you're done saying, I'm not going to consider this structure set. I've got a story, I've got an idea, whatever you've got, but now I'm willing to move the Lego pieces around to see really how this story best tells. And then the show don't tell thing, like I ride for that super, super hard. Like if it's possible to communicate via a behavior, an internal state, you know? Jealousy, um, you know, somebody keeps kind of, you know, her eyes keep falling to the expensive shoes or whatever, and kind of, you know, fiddle. whatever that is, like if you can come up with a behavior that demonstrates the internal feeling, almost always that will be more compelling because that's how we judge in real lives when we're not readers or writers. That's how we are actually perceiving people's interior states is exclusively through their behavior and sometimes, if we're lucky, what they say to us, right? Um, and so that kind of, like, where is your camera? The big feelings of a character should be capturable from a security camera on a bank. You know? So that, that would be my two cents. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. And best of, best of luck. Hi there. So um, my name's Andrea. Uh, my question is, what is your source of inspiration, not for your creative prowess, because I think you are your source of inspiration. So what is your source of inspiration for you? Who you are becoming, who you have become, how did you become you? That's really deep. Um, I mean, Sorry, honest, that is me. <laughs> the, the honest answer is I think I'm, I am reconsidering that question this year. That a lot of the patterns that worked for 20 years aren't working as well anymore. Um, so uh, I think that one's up for grabs. Do you know what I mean? Like when someone says, like, what's your favorite song that you most recently heard? Every once in a while, my answer is like, I'm looking for a new favorite song at the moment. You know, I I'd love to hear something that I'm super excited about. And I think even just like the performative stuff, uh, living living uh, a lot of my life on stage where you know your job is to be liked. You take that too far, and for all the reasons that you'd imagine, like that could be kind of shitty. You know what I mean? Just the, the not only like an impulse to please, but you can kind of be, I don't know, just always on or performative. Or instead of you know, someone's like, "What's your favorite book?" You're trying to think of what favorite book do you have in common instead of like consulting like what is your actual favorite book? Like not what is the answer that is true that would worst best in this scenario, but what is just the truest answer? Um, yeah, so I think I'm trying to like dial back to that a little bit. I'm reading right now um, a book that was given me, The Anthropocene Reviewed. <laughs> There's something cool in that, like that. I think it's also just like how to be, you know, a, how to be in youth culture and not how to be like, you know, a grown, a grown ass woman. You know, I'm trying to find like what is your personality as you as you age too. Like the fact that it worked for 20 years, man. Hey, awesome, it worked for 20 years. There's, there's something next. Though. So yeah, if anybody's got any book suggestions, it's twin tar. Um, but I'm on the move for it. Thank, thanks, for the, thanks for the question and the weird numbers. Okay. Hi, Dessa. I'm Catherine. Um, I have a really close friend, Carly, who grew up in Minneapolis and went to a lot of your early shows because I think she went to high school or college with you. Um, she really wanted to be here to see you again. She lives in Seattle, but she is fighting the good fight as a doctor um, taking care of COVID patients. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just a little video to say hi and uh, maybe like finger for me or... 
Sure. <laughs> oh, we're doing it now. Okay. <laughs> What's your name? Carly. Carly? Yes. Okay, ready. Oh, wait. This is That's the other... them. That's them. <laughs> Why do cameras work? I did it. Yay! We're here. Hi, Carly. Thank Hi, you so Carly. Much. Thanks for the hustle. Thanks for the sacrifice and for the hard work. And hello to you from Joko Cruz. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I think, I think that it's rare that any work is so done that you can't imagine one small change that would improve it. Do you know what I mean? I think that probably is true for most creative. But I would say that there is absolutely a temporal aspect, and for a few reasons. I Meaning, editing fresh, 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 you know, editing fresh, 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 almost everybody sucks at it because you're distracted by your memory of recent iterations. You forget that you never explained that so-and-so was a doctor because that was your first draft and then you cut that paragraph and you thought it would start better again. You've got too many, it's like you're seeing, you're in multiple dimensions. You're in V1, V2, V3, V4, and so it's very hard for you to read V5 accurately because you have so much more information in your head than a reader would. And the readers for whom you are editing, you know? But I would say that like sometimes also to remember the temporal aspect, like let's say that I mentioned so-and-so as a doctor, and then I do other things for pages and pages, and now I go back to them, right? And I need to think to myself, does the reader remember that they're a doctor, or do I have to seed something? Do they take off their scrubs, you know what I mean? Do, do I have to remind them? Sometimes what I'll do is when editing, like staples are small lies. Staples make pages convenient to carry from place to place. But staples are not representative of how words and time work. So what I'll do, is I'll tape all the pages end to end like that, and I'll put it down my hallway so that I can see, ah, it was two feet ago that I reminded somebody that was a doctor. But it was 10 feet ago that I introduced the character in the first place. So I can just get a better angle of like how long it's been, or like, yo, is this whole part of my kitchen like a description of the cave and it's only like this part of my threshold that's a description of what happens in the cave? Do I feel comfortable with that ratio? Like it's a truer read of what the, uh, it's, it's a true representation of how much time is devoted to all of your ideas. Um, but yeah, I would say that there is a, for writing anyway, I don't, yeah, my computer, when I get the ending right, it's like, oh! Yes, you did. Like I would say that out loud to myself because when the ending is nailed, now I have I can see, I can see where I'm going. You know. So very often, as soon as I get that last paragraph done, now I've got a north star, and driving there is way easier. Yeah. I, I don't want to be the audience member that asks too many questions, but I, I was wondering because that that's a really good answer for writing for oh. for story. I wanted, I'm for just wondering what it's more like for prose for you. Oh, I see, I see. Um, that I was talking about prose. That was prose for you, not rather than story. Okay. Do you mean like rather than like fiction story? Um, or, sorry, sorry. I mean more like poetry. More oh, more poetry? poetry. Oh, I see. Songwriting. Oh, songwriting. Okay. Well, now you're just saying all the genres, right? <laughs> okay. um, Let's say poetry. Poetry. Okay. Poetry. No, I would say it is harder than. And it is harder to feel crisp. So I would say, like, put away the drafts for it and revisit today. I was like, I didn't need that line. I hadn't opened some of these in six months. I think that the laying them on the cooling rack, you know what I mean? It becomes way more important because that, you know, in poetry, it's so much about this. Like, all words have a denotation and a connotation, right? So, microphone, there's the word, that the object that that word is a symbol for, right, is the object in my hand. That's also true of the word mic. But those words have different connotative values, right? Mic is more casual, right? comic, rapper, you know? We, we have a whole world of associations that vary slightly, even between things like cup, glass, teacup, let alone coupe, 
snifter. Like all of those have different, like, oh, that's that rich guy thing. Oh, that's that old English lady thing. Oh, that's that. And we import all of that world of connotation. It becomes so important in poetry. So yeah, it's all about that initial, like, blast of related ideas. So I think for that, it's just like, put the show on the shelf and visit where feels. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey there, uh, Chuck. Um, your movement is really incredibly graceful when you're doing both poetry and music. Is that something that's sort of premeditated, or do you just flow and it's just awesome? Um, you mean physical movement? Yeah. Oh, I mean, yesterday was a special case. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you served the ship pretty well. Um, I would say that sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. So, like, I think also if I sense a show isn't going as I want it to, that there will be a rapper's habit of literalism, which sometimes there is and sometimes doesn't. You know, you probably see rappers sometimes like, and then I fell and went to bed and I woke up and drank a thing. You know, it's just like, it's like pantomiming sometimes, which can help if you're in a room that has a lousy sound system, which we often are. And it's just like making sure that the nouns hit, that we know what actually we're talking to. But also people look bored, like movement, you know, we're all, we're all kittens with laser pointers, right? And so, I'll do that, and then also more in our more in the rap environment when it's of even me and Josh on stage like in a club where there's a lot going on. There's a bar over here, you know what I mean? And there's chatter and there's this freaking strobe lights and stuff. Like I will sort of do like the teacher detention that like if you look like you're not paying attention, do you know what I mean? I'll like do a lot of motion over here. Like, hello, hello. So, thanks for and thanks for the compliment. That's very nice. Okay, one more. Hi, Dessa. My name's Ariel. And uh, last night was the first time I heard you or heard of you. And I think you're a total badass. And you're so full of passion and um, vulnerability, and your poetry is so honest and real. And I'm wondering where you find the courage. Um, first of all, thank you for the compliment, you know, both explicit and applied, but I would say complicated. I mean, some of it is that I do feel afraid and uncomfortable, but I prefer that to not having tried and Tried to share something that felt true. Also, just my own like my own compass as a reader and a listener. That happens to be the stuff that I like. Do you know what I mean? So I know how it feels to hear or see somebody share something that's that's kind of intimate and that risks being made fun of or whatever. But when they do it well, I know how excited that makes me. Like uh, I was talking to um, my my bandmates about the the song that Amy Mann performed, like that Tourniquet song on the first night. God, I mean, for, forever, like that song. I've seen other people do it, so I know it can be done. But also I would say that, yeah, like that idea of whisk, risking the discomfort, because I think I would be more uncomfortable thinking, man, I could have done a really good song, right? I have a really good poem to share, or it's the true story is, but I'm too embarrassed to tell that true story. Like I'm a sucker for nonfiction, both lived, read, and performed. And so I think part of the, the entrance to that game is not confessionalism, but a willing to share some parts of your life that might make you feel uncomfortable. And I love the game so much that I'm willing to, to pay that ticket, to, to, to buy that ticket. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end with one more poem, and thank you guys for hanging out. Yeah. That's definitely the first page, so I guess. Okay. How to stage dive. At your first open mic, speak and sing more slowly than it feels natural. Time moves differently up there, and it always will. Accept every performance you are offered. When you get a plain envelope with some cash in it, pay a little tax anyway. The lamest shows in the coffee shops and the rec centers will be the most important of your career. Because the kid in the back 
grows up to work for Warner. Arrive on time, even if the headliner is late. Don't eat or drink anything expensive backstage unless invited. Stand by the merch booth after shows. If you played well and you have a Sharpie in your hand, it will occur to someone to ask for an autograph, and then a line will form. Carry reserves of aspirin, allergy medicine, hot sauce, Dramamine. <laughs> this habit will double your value to the touring party. No one is named Hey Sound Man. Is that why you're up there? So. <laughs> Do not trash the green room. Little clubs are owned by the same people who own big clubs, and you will need to come back to Omaha someday. Hire people you trust. Keyboard can be learned. Character cannot. Help load the heavy gear. The van will notice and talk about it when you are not around. Yes, a grilled cheese can't be made with a hotel iron. Do it once and then get over it. The grease is fucking up everybody's clothes. <laughs> Your van will be robbed. Carry the merch and the cash in every night. Perform at least one song very well during sound check. The bartenders are listening, and they are the vice roys here with the ear of the booker whose pen signs your checks. White shirts will show sweat strings. Tight stripes confuse the TV cameras. We all wear black for a reason. Invite the open when your name is on the marquee. Take a picture. You're allowed. Invite the openers to help themselves to the cheap views. Save the good stuff for your people. Pick a city where you have a strong draw, preferably a sellout. Walk to the edge of the stage and lift your arms. The front rows will know exactly what you are thinking. Rock back to the music twice to prime them, and then jump. Land on their bed of palms on your back, and you will not feel weightless. You will feel the full heft of your grown body muscled up to the light by drunk people of varying heights. <laughs> you will want to lift your head to look back at your band, your friends on stage, to say, this is madness, or come join me. But you don't have time for that because now you have to focus. Look up at the ceiling, the light trusses, the calcified smoke. Feel the fingers curl around your ankles. Listen to the voices below coordinating your safe passage and make yourself a battery to store some of this feeling because it is only dispensed this way, sandblasted, and it is the currency of your life. There will be many months and some years where you will receive no payments at all and you will need to draw on this reserve of elation Arrogance, selfishness, selfishness, and communion while your friends buy dogs and houses. You can't steer really. The crowd will set you back on stage when it is time. Thank <laughs> you.